So our Summer of Love is our current series. Uh, and today I'm thinking about Love Is. So at the beginning of the service, if you were here early, um, there was a running PowerPoint with some Love Is cartoons, but interspersed with the love of Jesus and the great love of Jesus. So we're going to be thinking about what love is today, this morning. I'm hoping that's going to work. Oh no, it's not doing anything. Oh, here we go. Never mind. We'll start by thinking that love is very confusing. All right, turn it off and on again. Just like, much seriously. All right. Um, love is very confusing. You know, we use the word love. Oh, there we go. There it is. We use the word love to describe lots of different things. We use the same word, and sometimes that muddles people. We use it when we're talking about a romantic love. And yesterday, many of us here were at, at the wedding of Ollie and Hannah, and that was a wonderful occasion. And we use the word love to describe that romantic love that we have for the person that we fall in love with. But we also use the same word when we say, oh, I love you, mate. Ah, oh, you're my best mate, I love you. It's the same word. But does it mean the same thing? And sometimes that can be confusing. When you, when you say that you love somebody in the second way, they might think you're talking about the first way. That could cause a few problems and be a bit awkward, couldn't it? And I expect it might have. We also use it when we talk about things like, I love chocolate ice cream. Or I love my pizza. We use the same word. Now imagine how confusing that would be. Do you want to marry a pizza? Probably not. Probably not. Some of you might. I don't know. Weird people here. But so it is confusing, isn't it? Because we're using the same word. And we also use it about family. I love my mum. I love my dad. I love my brother. <laughs> you know? Our siblings are brothers and sisters. We use the same word. It is very confusing. And some of us, the really weird ones, talk about work. <laughs> I love my job. Yeah, isn't that weird? And some people spend as much time as their job as they do at home, so they clearly do love it a lot. But isn't it, isn't it a muddle? When we have one word to describe lots of different things. So... When we talk about love and the love of Jesus, and, and uh, what do we actually mean? It's really difficult. Well, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, were very clever people. Very clever indeed. And they'd come up with, they had three or four different words. When they were talking about love, which is much more helpful. Much more helpful. And the first one, they used the word eros. And we don't see that used very much in the Bible at all, in the New Testament, but it's sort of linked with the idea of love and marriage, and it's that, it's that physical attraction that we feel between people. That falling in love feeling. Okay? And they, but they don't use that very often in the Bible. This one they use quite a lot. Philos. They use this a lot in the Bible. This is the, the word that's used when Jesus talks about the love he has for his disciples. And the love that he had for his close friend John. That's the word that's used. And it's used in the New Testament to describe the love that we have for our families. The love, that, 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 the devotion that we should have to our families, our friends and the church. And then there's agape that's used. Another word. This is the most, the most popular one that most people know when they're talking about love. This is the love that Jesus talked about when he talked about love your neighbour. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. And this is all about compassion. This is all about loving people you might not like. This is about loving the stranger. This is about showing compassion to those in need. It's easy now, isn't it, to see the different types of love when you've got different words. And Jesus calls us 
uses that word agape an awful lot when it's written in the New Testament. And Paul uses it an awful lot. And he uses philos an awful lot when he's writing about love in the New Testament. And one of the most famous passages that he uh, wrote about is in his letter to the church at Corinthians. So if you've got your Bible, let's turn to it. If you're on the church Bible, it's on page 1153. It's chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. What I want to do is to read this and then just unpick a few little bits from it to see what we can learn. So here we go. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, here he's using the word, what's he using? Is he using eros? Is he using philos? Is he using agape? Which one is he using? Agape? Agape. I have not love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not agape, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, and they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfection disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. And then we see face to face. Now... I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It always gives me a tingle, that last bit. What an amazing description of love. And it's not the love that's eros, it's the love that's philos and agape. The friendship, the devotion, the compassion. That's what Paul is talking about. So, what can we learn from that amazing passage? Well, I think we can learn what love is. That's quite clear. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I think we can learn about who we should be loving. And I think about, we can also learn about why we should be loving. Why we should be doing this. Well, let's start with what love is. Well, do you know what? Right in that beginning of that passage, Paul talks about the most excellent way. If we have agape and philos in our life, we have the greatest quality that we can ever possess. Isn't that incredible? The greatest quality that we can ever have. Our priority should be to develop agape. Compassion for other people and philos for our brothers and sisters in all areas of life. That should be our number one thing. Because that's the most excellent way in what Paul says, if you've got this, you've got everything you ever need. You could be an Einstein. 
But if you've got no love, it's pointless. It doesn't matter how clever you are, what mysteries you can solve, but if you're mean and miserable and you don't share your love and your knowledge, what's the point? You can talk about the future and you can be a, an excellent politician, you can be an excellent preacher, you can be an excellent this, that and other, but it doesn't really matter. If you've got no compassion, who cares? You're just a noisy gong. Nothing matters unless you've got love in your heart. So that should be our priority. Well, here we go. Look at these. When I was thinking about these, oof, it made me feel quite bad. I don't know about you. God will give us opportunities to develop these qualities. Now, I, I have a little office. Oh, I say office. It's more like a cupboard under the stairs at work. Um, it's a bit like Harry Potter's cupboard. Um, but they, they put me in there, and it's great because I'm all by myself, and I don't share an office with anybody, and I get in in the morning, and I have my little, uh, put a bit of music on, a bit of, bit of worship, and I have a little pray. And sometimes I say, Lord, I need some patience today. And the moment I've said that, I regret it. <laughs> Why do I regret it? Because I know that it's going to be a difficult day. Because if I'm praying for patience, what's God going to do? He's going to test me on it. So he's going to make it difficult. He's going to make, cause things to happen or allow things to happen. He's going to test my patience. And he's going to test my kindness. And he's going to test my humility. Can I, can I hold it together without, with the kids at work? Without calling them... <laughs> when they really begin to wind you up. Or the other members of staff. It's going to test my generosity, isn't it? When we say, pray, I need more love in my life. Yeah, okay, we'll give you money away then. <sighs> Open your wallet. Ooh. Be generous with your time. I can't do that. I've got to go and do this. When we want love in our lives, God's going to give us opportunities to show it. And that's going to test us. It's going to test us, isn't it? That's hard. So we have to be sure that we want God's love in our life. We want to reflect God's love. We have to be sure that we want it. Because it's going to be difficult. It's not easy. I mean, I'm looking around here. I can see difficult to love some of you guys here. I can see. Oi. Well, it's not you, of course. <laughs> There's a couple of youngsters up there looking a bit grim, aren't they? Uh, but, you know, you love them anyway. You love them anyway. And God tests you. So when we ask God for more love in our life, and we sing those songs, I want to sing of your love my guardian, and all the others. We're asking God to give us opportunities to grow love in our heart. And when we do that, he's going to test it. He's going to give us opportunities to do that. Lord, I want to become a better skydiver. Well, okay, jump out of a plane. <laughs> you can't do that. You have to jump out of the plane, don't you, if you want to be a better skydiver. You can't not do that. Well, so, you know, I think we can learn what love is, and we learn it the hard way. We learn it the hard way. So who do we love? Well... We went to a lovely wedding yesterday. I said with so many of you there, it was absolutely beautiful. But actually, the love that Paul is talking about in that passage is not love for couples. That's not what he's describing, although it's brilliant if married couples can do that because it will improve the quality of their relationship no end. If they can be patient with each other and kind with each other, it would be lovely, wouldn't it? But actually, it's not intended for, 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 for loved-up couples. It's intended for the church. Paul's talking about the church. This is how we should behave to each other. With patience and kindness and gentleness and all those other things. And, 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 and selflessness and generosity. That's what he's talking. Talking about the church. The previous part of the passage was all about what the church is doing. That's the context. Well, he's also talking about for the rest of the world. All those people who don't come to church. All those people who, who don't even agree with Christianity. Who don't want to know. He's talking about them too. That's what that passage is all about. That makes it even harder, doesn't it? So that's, that's who. So why? Why? Because actually, I, when I look at 1 Corinthians 13, and I look at those qualities in there, I see Jesus, don't you? Just, not, just me then. Yeah. Well, I'm on my own. Yeah, yeah. I see Jesus. Look at this patience. 
kindness. Here we go, let's go back and have a look. Love is patient. So, Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He doesn't boast. He wasn't proud. He wasn't rude or self-seeking. He wasn't easily angered. He didn't keep a record of wrongs. He didn't delight in evil, but rejoiced in the truth. He always protected, always trust God, always hoped, and always persevered. He didn't give up. That's Jesus, isn't it? When we look at the New Testament and the life of Jesus, that's, that's, a, that's a description of the, of, the, of the person of Jesus. Wow. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus then, don't we? If we want to develop love, and we want to grow in God's love, and find out what love is, we have to look at Jesus. And when we look and study the life of Jesus and we ask for Jesus' help through God's Holy Spirit, he will make us better at loving others. He will improve our philos, our agape. That's what he wants to do. He wants to make us better people. The people we were designed to be before sin got in the way. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When we begin to look at Jesus and copy what he did and his behaviours, as best we're able to, we grow in those qualities of love. Well, I know Chris had an invention last week that he was working on, and it is August and we have got a bit more time, so I've been working on my own invention. It, it, It is called the... It is called the Mirror of Jesus. I'm thinking of a better name, but I can't work it out at the moment. And, and, and what happens is, is that if it works, what you do when you look at it, you see Jesus. Who wants to come and have a go? I'm still working on it. Would anyone like to have a look? Yeah? Okay. The mirror of Jesus. When you look in it, you should see Jesus if it's working. Do you see Jesus? No? No? Do you see Jesus yet? Anyone see Jesus yet? Who, who are we seeing? No, that's Father Christmas. <laughs> <coughs> are we seeing Jesus? Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty close. Pretty close. Oh, wait, anyone see Jesus yet? Up there. Oh, maybe I haven't perfected it yet. Maybe it's not quite working. Pardon. (laughs) It's not working. Is it working? Yes, it is, isn't it? So what's wrong then? We We don't have enough love, do we? Because in 1 Corinthians 13 it says... Here we go. Whew. Now we see but a poor reflection. Now we see but a poor reflection. I, I, I looked in that for ages and I couldn't see Jesus. All I saw was me. And there were bits of me that's okay. And there are bits of me that need improving. And I suspect if we all looked at it, it would all feel the same. But it's a poor reflection. We don't quite see Jesus yet. But what Jesus wants us to be is much more like him. To become more like him in love. So our week, this week's challenge, I'm nearly finished. This week's challenge is how can you reflect the love of Jesus in your life a bit more? How can we show a bit more patience, a bit more generosity, a bit more gentleness, a bit more forgiveness, a bit more resilience? Pray for opportunities, because if we don't pray for opportunities, God won't make it grow. It's not going to happen magically. You have to ask Jesus for it. Pray for the Holy Spirit to transform you. I know when I became a Christian when I was 14, when I first committed my life to Jesus, I wasn't particularly a great teenager. There were lots of horrible things in my life. And it's taken a few generations... (laughs) to iron them out and I'm still not perfect working on it but there's a long way to go still but we have to ask we have to keep praying don't we and so why finally should we love 
Well, this is what love is. That whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that the best action of love? Oh, it keeps going by itself, right? The greatest love of all is God's amazing grace for us, isn't it? That he died. Not many of us are called to die for other people out of an act of love, but Jesus did. And when Jesus died on that cross, that big book of Jess Taylor's sins that Chris had last week was nailed to the cross and it was taken away. And I'm no longer held to account for that because Jesus died for me. And when I prayed that prayer as a teenager, Jesus took away my sin. That's an act of an incredible love. Amazing love. And I've experienced God's amazing grace in my life ever since. And many of you have too, haven't you? Let's stand and sing.